Welcome back, fans. This isn't the vision I had for the show this year. Or, well, any year, for that matter. But, despite the many problems out there, I still plan to bring you a thrilling broadcast this year to help you celebrate the spooky month. That's right, no matter what they say, we won't cancel the show. By locking myself in this bunker and my constant use of a mask, we are in full compliance with health and safety guidelines and ready to deal with any virus, roaming bands of flesh-eating raiders, and alien invasions. So, if anyone has the ignorant thought of trying to cancel Halloween, then please, share this show with them. I've had to rush some, but I was able to grab a few tapes to bring down here with me into the bunker, and of course, we are still accepting calls from viewers like you. I am mostly sure that there won't be too much interference with the line this year. Uh, when I tested it, we had a stable connection, but... Yeah, you know, I'm sure the swirling black clouds with green lightning were just your typical autumn thunderstorm. Well, regardless of the weather, it is the perfect time to read you a story. I've been writing for as long as I could remember. Ever since I was a kid, it was my way of escaping the boring reality and immersing myself in the fictional world, which I could create by putting words on paper. From such an early age, I knew that writing was exactly what I wanted to do in life, regardless of whether I'd be doing it for free or for money. Luckily though, through perseverance and hard work, I managed to make it a full-time job, and sold thousands of copies thus far. But self-promotion is not the reason why I'm here. I'm here to tell you about a series of events that's happened to me lately, which I can't quite explain. Recently, strange occurrences have been happening in my life and more and more I'm starting to get convinced that it is more of a coincidence than an unsavory prank. Let me take it from the top. A week ago, I returned home and found one of my books open on my kitchen table. It was my first published book called The Struggles of the Heart. The book was a fictional story but utilized real characters, including myself as the protagonist, and the people that I knew. When I glanced at the book, I realized it was open on page 124, and a certain paragraph was highlighted. The paragraph reads as, He opened the envelope and his heart started racing. He reread the lines over and over, darting over them speedily, but no matter how many times he read them, the sentences remained the same. He dropped the envelope and rubbed his eyes, sighing in despair. Although he saw it coming miles away, he didn't know how he would pick himself up from getting evicted from his apartment. He figured he could stay with his sister for a while, despite their relationship not being so good over the last few years. The first thing that struck me as odd was the fact that I didn't remember leaving the book open on this particular page, or even taking it off the shelf for that matter. I live alone, so no one else could have done it. But I figured I must have done it unconsciously earlier when I was in a hurry to the dentist and couldn't find my keys. That still didn't explain why the paragraph was highlighted, but the book has been sitting here for years, so maybe my ex-wife fiddled with it while we were still living together? Two days later, I received a letter in my mailbox. On top of the letter, with big, bold letters, I saw the title, Eviction Notice. I rapidly skimmed through the letter and deduced that the reason for my eviction was not paying rent. This was a mistake though because I always paid my rent on time, so I decided to go back to my apartment and make a call to fix this right away. The lady who answered the phone, although very polite and patient, was able to confirm to me that the rent had indeed not been paid, and not just that, but apparently I was late with the rent a few consecutive months prior to that, and the only reason why I wasn't evicted was the landlord's goodwill. I explained that this must have been some kind of mistake, but the lady confirmed once more that there was no mistake, and I had three days to move out. Communication with the landlord was impossible as well, since he hired an agency to do everything for him, as he lived outside the country. After a few hours of pursuing and trying to fix the problem, I realized that there was no point in fighting and that I would have to look for another apartment. It wasn't until I started packing and picked up the book again that I remembered seeing the highlighted paragraph from a few days ago. I started thinking that someone was setting me up or trying to prank me, but I had no idea who would do it. 
None of my friends had such bad taste in jokes, and besides, it didn't explain how they would even get inside my apartment in the first place and perform such an elaborate thing. Also, they can get a kick out of my predicament? Nevertheless, I decided to continue packing in hope that someone would jump up in front of me when I stepped out of the apartment and shout, Got you. Two days had gone by and I had already arranged to move in with my sister until I found a new apartment. She was completely okay with me being there as long as I needed and I thanked her for that. I was about to get out of my apartment with my bags packed when I saw a slip of paper under my door. I picked it up and realized that I was staring at a page from my book. It said, The news devastated him. His older brother was like a father to him throughout his entire life, and hearing about his car crash was like getting stabbed in the heart and the knife being twisted. The doctor said that he died instantly, crushed by the truck, so there was virtually no chance of resuscitating him. What would happen to his children now? Their mother left years ago when they were still young, and there was no trace of her anywhere. He'd gladly take the responsibility of raising them since he saw them as his own children in many ways but he was barely able to support himself financially, let alone two extra children. My phone started to ring and I answered it without even looking at the caller. Hello, I said. I heard my sister's voice on the other end. She was crying and gasping for air. Kelly, Kelly, are you okay? I asked. She whimpered for a moment before saying, It's Michael, he's... She burst into tears again. I felt my stomach dropping to the floor and my heart began to race, already anticipating the worst news. What about Michael? Kelly, what happened to him? I pressed her, but it was no use as she couldn't form the words between her sobs. He... he's... he's had a car accident. He's gone. She burst into even more violent sobs, but before I could continue asking questions... My phone slipped out of my hand and dropped to the floor. I, f I felt as if I had just been hit by a truck myself. I started hyperventilating. My vision got blurry from the tears forming in my eyes. I tried pushing the feeling away, but the harder I tried, the more it seemed to intensify. I dropped on the floor, crying for hours. My older brother was dead. Two days later, I was at my sister's place. I settled in already and had started planning Michael's funeral. Although the circumstances of Michael's death were indeed bizarre, I was in mourning and didn't even think about the possibility of someone being out to get me and going through such lengths that they would murder my brother. At the time, all of it being a crazy coincidence is the only explanation I had. Kelly had already flown out of state to Michael's town and I had planned to join her as soon as I wrapped up my own work. It was around midnight when I was doing some writing to take my mind off things, when I got thirsty and decided to go down to the kitchen for some milk. I drank directly from the carton, and it wasn't until I closed the fridge that something caught my attention. There, in the middle of the fridge, among Kelly's kid's drawings, stuck by a smiley face magnet, was another page from my book. With trembling hands, I picked it up, dreading what I would read next. I had to hold the paper with both hands to be able to read it properly, as my hands were trembling so badly. It said, There was a knock on the door. Peering through the peephole, he saw his ex-wife's angry face staring blankly at him. He opened the door and braced himself with a flurry of swear words and accusations that she would force him to endure. She was right to do so, but despite that, he wasn't ready for this just yet. Just then there was a knock on the front door. I started in the direction of the foyer, my heart just about ready to leap out of my chest. It was so deafeningly quiet that I heard my own quivering breath until the loud knocking resounded in the house once more, almost making me jump out of my own skin. The knocking sounded impatient and angry and I knew that whoever was out there at this time of night had no intention of having a friendly chat. I slowly approached the front door, trying to be as quiet as possible while the knocking persisted, louder and more frantic this time. Carefully, I peered through the people, and sure enough, 
my ex-wife's face stared right back at me. If the events in reality follow the events in the book, then this encounter would be mostly innocuous. Stressful, at most, I thought. There was just one problem, though. My ex-wife died three years ago.